Hi, welcome to the Regeneration Podcast. I'm Michael Martin with my co-host, Mike Sauter. How are you doing, Mike? I'm doing great, Michael. How are you doing? Uh, good. It's been a crazy week. <laughs> we started the week with no water. We, uh, I w- woke up last Saturday morning and went to wash my hands and there was no water. We were afraid we dried the, dried the well out, which wow. was not the case. They got, but it was a little, it was a little weird for a minute there because you want water. Yeah, really want water. That, that's, uh, I think you're, you're, you have an understatement with that. And uh, let me ask you this briefly. If you, if you take water from a well and it runs dry, do you goop up the drawing source? Like, you know, even a fuel tank, we have fuel oil. If we let it run dry, we have to pay a lot more because they have to clean the intake. Well, no, they would, if, if the well runs dry, they have to drill a new one, which is oh, wow. yeah. okay. expensive. But, uh, but they didn't have to do that. And the guy told me, he checked the well, he said, you have enough water for a couple of lifetimes. So you're, you're in good shape. Great news. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, welcome to the podcast. And today it is a great pleasure for us to talk to Michelle Bowens, who now lives in Thailand, but was born in Belgium. And here's a little trivia. The, the, my first memories as a child are of my living at my grandmother's house in a Belgian neighborhood in Detroit. And you can, oh, wow. it's yeah. still, it's still, there's still remnants of the Belgianness in this neighborhood. Uh, there's uh, even uh, a Belgian restaurant where you can, you can go feather bowling. So, well, let me put my finger in geopolitics there and invite Michelle. Walloon or Dutch? I had a daughter who spent a year in a Liege, so I know the differences. And I would say, you know, these are two completely different cultures. And since Michelle yeah. is French speaking, he's a Walloon, presumably. Am I right? Uh, no, actually, oh. I'm uh, I'm a true Belgian in the sense that uh, my father was Flemish, okay. from Ghent, and my mother was uh, French speaking from Brussels. So not nice. Walloon, but the yeah. French speaking from Brussels, which is which is quite different. Yeah. And so I'm a typical mix uh, okay. uh, of uh, you know, and in the beginning that's quite hard because the Flemish and the Walloons they tease each other, you know. Uh, and so you're always receiving the critiques on both sides and you, you feel, you know, you, you feel the pain from both sides. Uh, <laughs> I've always told people I that I've once, never, oh, go ahead. <clears throat> once you get over it, it's so enriching because you have, you know, the pulsation of two different cultures, the Northern European and the Southern European. And, you know, as you know, it's quite, quite different. Uh, the, you know, Protestant reformation, disciplined, uh, interiorized uh, Protestant mentality versus the, you know, the mm-hmm. we can sin because we can go to confession. Southern, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Southern culture. That's great. Um, and Belgium is, you know, at, at that at that frontier and okay. mixes both, and it's mm-hmm. quite interesting to live there. Uh, yeah, well, that's great. Now, to tell our our listeners, uh, Michelle is uh, is the founder of the. Uh, of the P- P2P Foundation, correct? Uh, which P2P yes. stands for Peer to Peer. Right. And it's really a, a fascinating work that Michelle is doing, and I'll ask him to explain it in a second. He's also the author. Now, on Wikipedia, they have three of your books listed. One, mm-hmm. it looks like one in Dutch, one in French, and one in English. The, the one in uh, right. Network Society and Future Scenarios for a Collaborative Economy. Uh, because this is uh, Michelle's work is seeing what the inter uh, the internet could actually be used for for the good of humanity. Am I correct? Yes. Well, you know, I try to look at the bad as well. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah, bad, is, the bad yeah. is making itself known. Yeah. So, Michelle, why don't you explain to us your your work in with the P two P Foundation and tell us why that's that that's a uh, a, a good thing for thing, people to think about. Right. Well, okay, I'll, I'll just give you like a minimal personal background. Um, you know, I'm a kind of a working class person. My, my two parents were uh, half orphans and orphans. My mother was illiterate. We were very poor when I was a child. And then I, you know, I'm a child of the welfare state, got free education free medicine. And, uh, you know, my father got a interest-free loan to buy a house. Um, 
but I was uh, you know, quite rebellious when I was young. I was actually a Marxist, a Trotskyist to be precise. And then I noticed you know, that wasn't working. And I said, okay, if I can change, if I can't change the world, I have to change myself because I would not be happy otherwise. And I still started doing personal work. Then I had a, like a spiritual phase. Um, and then you know, when I was about 30, I thought, okay, I've done enough of myself. I need to you know, bring some creativity in the world and, and, and do some good stuff. And I became an entrep- like a progressive entrepreneur. Um, but I ended up you know, working for uh, British Petroleum, uh, working for United States Information Agency, working for the biggest telco as a as a like internet strategy director. Uh, but as the mid '90s uh, came, I, I just felt that you know all the indicators were going red. Like I, I didn't see that the world was going in the right direction, and, and so I thought like. You know, maybe I should reconnect with my youthful passion for change because I think where I am now working for these big, big companies, I don't think I'm part of the solution. I think I'm part of the problem. Mm-hmm. And remember, if you remember, 95 is the, the time of the, you know, Seattle demonstrations. as Zapatistas. So there was like a, a return of, an, you know, some kind of like challenge to, to the system. But my big question was, OK, so Marxism didn't work for me, it, you know, and obviously didn't work for the world as well. So how, how do we change? So that was my big question. And so I took a two year sabbatical to study transitions. And, you know, I plan to look at those transitions, but, you know, two years is, is actually quite fast. So I ended up mostly focusing on the reformation and the, the end of the Roman empire, which was, you know, already a big chunk enough. And I came up with this idea of seed forms, right? So that basically you have like a relatively stable system. You have some crisis of complexity or differentiation. The old institutions are no longer able to to keep it together. You know, the ideational glue is no longer working to keep the society together. You get a polarization, you get a crisis. And the new for me uh, came from these seed forms. For example, you think about the capitalism. Okay, well, purgatory, right? Purgatory. I mean, at least there's one uh, one historian that, that documents that in a book, Jacques Le Goff, who who shows us, you know, purgatory allowed Christians to do business. You know, before uh-huh. usury was actually defined as interest. So interesting. You know, the, wow. The Jews, wow. The wow. Jews were doing, yeah. yeah. The Jews were doing, you know, the, the banking. And then as the cities grew, there was a need for more capital. And so this pressure, and then you, so purgatory allows, you know, it's defined as a minor sin to, to do business and, and to lend money. And so you can pay back your sin. And interestingly, that's already an accounting system, right? So purgatory not just huh. ushers in like the capacity to do business in the cities, but it's actually itself a way of thinking that is an accounting system. This is worth the price of admission already. This is why. <laughs> uh, and so then you have the printing press and you know the inventing of a double entry book accounting by Franciscan monk. I forgot his name. Mm-hmm. So these are seed forms, right? So these are people that are leaving feudalism, you know, settling in the cities and trying new things that are outside of the feudal system. And then they will interconnect, for example, businesses will be created using the printing press because it's it's light machinery and these people are starting to travel around in the, in the cities and spreading uh, the message of the reformation for example right and it goes so fast that the church is no longer able to control that that flow of, of new ideas and so if you ask the question then well what what today are the seed forms and, and so my argument that this is something i had seen before my study but I, can, I kind of put two and two together. Well, peer to peer. So the, the so if you define civilization as a way to organize city and country, right? The city as a managerial uh, core, and then the city as and the country as producing f- food surplus. So civilization is a particular arrangement between agriculture and knowledge. Uh, based on you know writing and then printing, uh, and it's territorial. 
with internet, what we get is a many-to-many, point-to-point, peer-to-peer communication medium that is deterritorialized, right? And so basically, I think this challenges all the, you know, the premises of our civilization. Because what we need to do now is find a new arrangement between territorial arrangements and non-territorial arrangements. And I think this is new. So you could say that there have been like three civilizational types. You know, the first one was Mesopotamia, Egypt, Persia. Then the Greeks invented like the mythic rational. They added rationality to the mix, uh, which is probably to do with the alphabet. You know, there's people who make the the linkage between the alphabet as the tool that made that possible. Uh, Then industrialization could be like the third phase you know, starting the 1600s, a new type of nation state based civilization. Uh, and I think now we are at the cusp of the fourth. Uh, the, and I, I call this the cosmolocal civilization. Because I think, so I look at Ukraine and the conflict in Ukraine as a struggle between the rentier capitalist system of the West, you know, the maritime financial power mm-hmm. versus the state sovereign. Uh, Eurasian continental power of Russia and China. I look at it the same and, way. Yep. Right, and every every world war actually has been a war of systems. You look at World War One; it eliminated the empires, and it kept you know for the first time only nation states remain. You look at World War Two; it's a war between fascism, communism, and parliamentary uh, cap- capitalism. Right, and I mm-hmm. I think Ukraine is. Even though we're not fighting it with arms, uh, we, you know it's very localized in terms of military. But I think it's a world war between two systems. One is characteristically using financial weapons, and the other one is characteristically using military weapons because it cares about land. It's you know they're sovereignist, right. but both are based on rivalry, so both lead to war. Um, and so the cosmolocal idea is that we need to relocalize our economies because of thermodynamic realities. We spend three times more transporting goods than we are, than we are making them. So just by relocalizing, we, you know, we can save uh, three fourths, two thirds of, of matter energy. Uh, and so in other words, maintain complexity as we go down, right? right. And I, I think this is a challenge. So. So if you follow my reasoning, so you have a crisis of complexity and differentiation. This leads to fragmentation. Fragmentation leads to polarization. And there is always a party that wants to go back to to simplify the civilization. And I hope you won't be offended, but I think the Christians did that in the fifth century. You know, I agree that Christianity created a great civilization. They're doing it now again. Don't you agree? Oh, yeah, yeah, well, okay, we, we, I think okay, we can yeah. return to that. Um, because this is the thing, okay, cosmolocal is not the same as local. Mm-hmm. I, I will make the point later. But I just want to say that, so you have the pagan church versus the Christian church, right? And the Christian church wins, but it is to some degree a simplification of the civilization. Yeah. In, in all ways, like the roads, the ceramics, the books, uh, the dogmas versus the, you know, the pluralist uh, philosophical schools of antiquity. However, the Reformation, where you know the Puritans are this force, you know, they they, they don't want ungodly people in power. So, I think capital state nation, as the answer of Hobbes and Smith and and others, you know, to this three uh, three centuries of of strife, is actually an escape. Uh, to a higher level of complexity because religion remains free and differentiated. It's not abolished. Mm -hmm. So they they retain the complexity and and create something that contains it. So I think that was, even though I'm very critical of capitalism myself, I I actually think that in terms of complexity, this was like a higher level of complexity, whereas the Christian change was a lower level of complexity. And, you know, and it took five centuries to uh, to establish uh, a complex civilization. And I've come to the conclusion that 
you know, I call it the pulsation of the commons, which is that you have these extractive periods of history where markets and states are oriented towards conquest and growth and, you know, expanding territories, expanding matter and energy usage. They overuse their regional boundaries. There is this integration and collapse. And as that happens, uh -huh. the people allied with spiritual reformers go back to the commons mm -hmm. and right. they heal and regenerate their um, their territory it doesn't always succeed but it, it often does and paradoxically by creating a new surplus they recreate a new wave of extraction fascinating okay? and so this is documented by peter turchin in secular cycles for agricultural civilizations it's documented by world systems theory they call it phase a and phase b uh it's documented in, within How capitalism peter by polanyi Peter Durchin, okay. his last name. How is his last name spelled? Peter Durchin? Yeah, Durchin is T-U-R-C-H-I-N. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah, it's a very interesting person. And he created a database of, of world historical facts. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're trying to, you know, really base their history on, on material and empirical uh, mm -hmm. basis. Uh, so Polanyi that does it for oh, capitalism, Polanyi, right? Sure. Karl Polanyi, the Lib Lab cycle. Mm -hmm. um, and so what happens, in my view, is that whereas agricultural civilizations would collapse, the capitalism has serially exhausted frontiers. And so it appeared as if that pulsation was overcome. But then it reaches the, the level of global planetary overshoot. And that means that we have to abandon the pulsation itself. This is very important. We can't just go, we can't just heat it for once. We actually need to shift to the civilizational model, right? And so that brings us from not just the fourth civilizational era, but actually to the second actual revolution. Because civilization is also an extractive relation to nature that we somehow have to overcome. And so create kind of a permanent, you know, method of exchange with nature that doesn't exhaust it. Right. that maintains the web of life, that maintains diversity. And we can do this within the present paradigm. Mm -hmm. And so th there we were talking more about also like even consciousness change and you know, looking at the world in a different way. Uh, right. You know, I, I can't anticipate all the details of what is happening, but I think this is why the current crisis is so difficult because it's, yeah. it's almost inhumane what is asked of us, you know, right. in terms of like change. Now, this is fascinating to me because, you know, in a way, what you just described was a biodynamic farm, right? <laughs> a regenerative right. thing in, in relationship with nature. Uh, and this word you use a lot in your work, commons, which I know you know, yeah. that this is, you know, in my, you know, I'm a, 17, I'm a scholar of 17th century English literature. So commons is a big word in English literature because of, of the enclosure laws that happen. Yeah. Um, so when you use the word commons in, in uh, reference to peer-to-peer -peer, uh, things or the internet, what do, you, what do you mean by that? And one quick thing, I'd, I'll tell our listeners, I've got to run to a funeral in a little bit, but I do, uh, I'm going to be listening to this. I'll be a, a listener to the Regeneration podcast more than a participant. But if sometime later in the conversation, uh, Michelle, if you can... If you're familiar with it, uh, you know, at the Vatican, they have the Pope's Council for Inclusive Capitalism. You know, I wonder if you if you're familiar with that. And if you if you don't hold back, I'm not looking for you to beat up on it. If but it seems to me just filled with the I'll, regular rentier. I'll, touch, I'll touch the subject. I, I will answer uh, the question yeah. by by Michael. And then I, I you know, if Michael reminds me, I, I will. Yeah. Super. Talk super. about. I, I actually am a big fan of the social teaching of the Catholic Church. Absolutely. And I think it is very close to peer to peer. So I actually want yeah. to explain this because you know you have this particular audience. Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, great. Yeah. And thank you. Thank you, Mike. It's I'll... really great to, to have met you. Sure. You can you can start so, talking. <clears throat> so, All right. So yeah. So uh, Michael, uh, the the question was about the comments. Yes. So I, I define the commons uh, as three things in one, which is, you know, like the Trinity. <laughs> uh, it's a resource mm -hmm. that is created, managed, or protected 
by a community or a group of stakeholders. So that's number two, using their own regulations. So these three things have to go together. So it's something, right? And I say it's something because people now are using the common and it becomes quite metaphysical. I say, no, 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 it's not the same. The commons is a thing. It can be an immaterial thing, like, an open, like a collection of open source code or a knowledge commons, right? But it is a thing. It is something that is productive. Then the second aspect means it is a choice. It's, a, it's an activity by humans. So some people think that certain things can be commons and other not. No, I, I think it's a choice. So it's uh, easier to do certain things as commons, and it may not be optimal to have everything as a commons, but basically it's a choice. Like how do we treat a particular resource? Do we treat it as a state resource, as a public resource, as a private resource managed by private property decisions, or do we actually choose you know, the, the third way, which is a collective, mm -hmm. uh, uh, collective management of the resource? And then the third is the, the own regulations. So the people make their own rules. And that means that the rules can be very different because a commons is an object-oriented relationality. So you relate to each other because you love something in common. You want to make open source. You want to make a new type of knowledge. You want to have an urban garden that you manage together, uh, cooperative housing, shared transportation. But it's there's something that binds the people you know, to the, and so it's, a, it's an institution, just as the market and the state, for me, the commons is an institution. And this is, you know, why I talk about cosmolocalism means a common centric civilization, right? So in other words, you don't abolish private and public spheres, but you bind them within what I call magisteria that are cosmoglocal, global, translocal institutions that are able to protect a resource base or a web of life. Right. Right. Now, that, what do you, that is, that is the, that's the shift. So, so who, who would be the, this uh, trans global organization that would kind of oversee this? That's, that's, that's the, for me, the big question, right? So it could be two things. It could be uh, a civic organization, which is purely civic or it could be multi-stakeholder. So I'll give you an example. So in Italy, they changed the constitution to allow subsidiarity. It's called the Rodotta Amendment. I, that was done like 20 years ago, I think. And then Bologna used that to create the Bologna regulation for the care and regeneration of the urban commons. And so basically the formula, I think it's brilliant, allows any group of people in the city to say, we want to care for this particular resource, you know, like an abandoned plant or a park that has been, you know, not cared for well by, by, the, by the city or cleaning up the Tiber in, in Rome. Mm -hmm. And so they go to the city lab, they make an agreement with the city and that's called a commons accord. And, you know, for example, yes, you can manage that park. You can even have pigs for the children but you have to take care of those animals according to city rules. So they, you know, they both okay. sign that contract and that gives legitimacy to the commons. And Ostrom, who is the, you know, the big um, economist who studied the commons, she says that yes, the commons are autonomous, but they have to have agreements with public authorities because otherwise they don't have legitimacy and they can be destroyed by the police, right? So you actually need some kind of agreement between the relative autonomy of the commons and the larger political regime right. that is that is dominant, right? And that so and that, that kind of let begs me the just question. finish because it's important. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So the the what the city does in Italy is they they direct something that they call the quintuple helix, and the city, the commercial sector, the research sector, and the formal NGO sector. Those four will have the fifth sector, which is the you know, common centric civic initiatives. And that has been replicated in 250 European cities, uh, Italian cities. 
and has mobilized one million Italians doing urban common, right? So I, I think this is a very interesting way forward. And what I imagine is, and this is my answer, is, well, this should be a fractal, right? So you have that at the local level, but if, let's say you do fair BNB instead of Airbnb, you know, you know Airbnb, right? And it, right. it produces mm -hmm. gentrification. So a new model is called fair BNB. It already exists, it's very small, but it exists. And you could say, well, it's in the interest of cities to create and support fair BNBs instead of Airbnb. But if you do all the same, well, why not ally? So then you could have like a civic or city coalition, right? And so what you would have is fractally the same structure at the trans local domain. In this case, it wouldn't be a purely civic organization like you know, the FLOSS foundations are purely civic organizations. Uh, well, actually, they, they also have companies in them, you know, like Linux Foundation and Drupal Association. Right. So these are the, the these translocal domain organizations that manage the infrastructure of cooperation of open source projects. Well, I think we need something similar at the level of mutualizing urban provisioning systems. And so it would coexist at the local level and at the translocal level, right? Mm -hmm. So we have international state organizations like the IMF, the World Bank, the UN, and we have transnational capital. What we are missing, and that's what I call the commons gap, are translocal civic or multi-stakeholder organizations that can, pro can protect the commons, human and extra unit right this, and this is the task we we, we I, I see as as very important that we don't have right and that's what i was noticed as i was going to bring up is that knowing the the history of the commons in europe you know they disappeared for a reason and the re and the, it's an interesting and you i'm sure you've read the literature some of the literature suggests well the, the peasantry wasn't really using, making good use of the commons. So, right. so the government came in and took over, right? Which was not really the case. It was that people wanted the land, just like with the, 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 the visitation of the monasteries in England during the Reformation, right. they, just took the, they wanted the land and they took it away. Right. But they had, the, the, the reason they took it away uh, was not the reason it was given. You know, yeah. So, and that's the, and I mean, to me that's yeah. the danger with that this idea. I mean, I like this idea enormously, but you know, and I and I don't know what to do to prevent that from happening. And I think we actually we see it happening with the internet now. And yeah. and I yeah. you, well, you mentioned we, you mentioned when your your work started in the '90s or you started thinking about some of these things and introducing them. And if you we remember the early 90s and late 80s with the internet, it was a much freer domain than it is now. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what do we do? Well, yeah, I, you know, uh, I don't have any easy answer to this. Yeah. Um, um, so that's one of the reasons that I'm, I'm reading a lot of macro history right now. So I took, an, you know, after 20 years, I took a new sabbatical. Mm -hmm. uh, during COVID, and I, I'm starting to read, you know, uh, Spengler, Toynbee, William Irving Thompson, Gene Gebser. Uh, I'm going to do all of them. I, you know, may yeah. may last 20 years now, but I'm I'm committed to read all of them. Sorokin, Sarkar, Robindo, Teilhard de Chardin. I just want to absorb their insights, and and so. Um, you know, classically, this is Toynbee, right? He would say that to the last stage of an empire is a universal state, right? It's it's uh, basically an ethnic group that conquers and then says, okay, now we, we're too big. We have to give citizenship to everyone that we conquer. So that's a universal state. And But then usually after two centuries, universal states start weakening and that creates the universal churches. So the, the, what he calls the internal proletariat, which no longer feels protected and cared for, self-organizes you know, around spiritual revolutions and, and new ways of seeing the world that carry the loyalty of the people, right? right. And then you have what he calls the uh, Volker Wanderung, the nomadic crisis, 
so the, the the universal state is no longer able to protect its borders it gets overrun but these tribal forces are not able to manage a complex society and so they need to ally with the universal church mm -hmm. well it's a big question what is that universal church right uh, and, I, and i and i think i don't have work. the answer right now but i think i think that you know there's plenty of new spiritualities emerging uh, including a revival, of course, of the old, like, you know, what, that's what you represent, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the, you know, I listen to you and I listen to new polity. I, I really like what they're doing as well. I don't know what you think about them, but I, no, I think I that, think I know them. oh, wow. <laughs> well, so, so new polity is a group of uh, social Christians, Catholics. Okay. And they just created St. Joseph College. And so, uh, you know, yeah, I haven't heard of, these of guys. Neo, Neo, Well, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely check it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they're yeah. very interesting because they're sophisticated. They're not just like neo reactionaries. They are people who study Ivan Illich. All right. And they study Judith Butler to criticize her, but with knowledge, right? They just don't say stupid things about Judith Butler. They actually right. read her. <laughs> yeah. So they have, you know, because like Jordan Peterson, which I find very interesting on comparative mythology and comparative religion and Jungianism and clinical psychology is, is a great professional. But when he talks about postmodernism, mm -hmm. he hasn't read it. Yeah. He's, you know, it's and a that's superficial. It's a superficial, it. right? Yeah. So these guys of new polity, they're real intellectuals. And I don't think they're like reactionary in the political sense, like some other you know Catholic thinkers might do. They are you know, they're more like Catholic worker. Uh, so right. they, of course, they're culturally conservative and anti-abortion and all of that, but they are they are politically and socially, you know, sympathetic to the working class. Yeah, which which is a good which is where I am. And and I think yeah. you know, I have taken from the very beginning of my encounter with your work. You know, there's kind of an unspoken spiritual dimension there. You know, it's. It's the third, it's the, the, the third not given, but it's there. It's definitely yeah. there. Um, and now when we talk, and Mike was mentioning earlier, uh, when we first got online here, our friend Guido Preparata. And, you know, Guido is a kind of a Christian anarchist type. And certainly Mike and I are, are sympathetic in that direction. And, but he, his criticism of Christian anarchism is that a lot of Christian anarchists are are like the Amish and you know kind of reject modernity and technology and things and, right. and I and I think it's a valid criticism. Yeah. Um, my but my question, you know, I've been actually puzzling over this for the for the last few days is, you know, you know the idea from Vaclav Havel and his contemporaries of of the parallel police, right? The the parallel structure of society. Are you familiar with this? Yeah. Yeah, and no, so not really, no, not well, really. Well, it's yeah, it's, it really yeah. speaks to your work. It really speaks to your work because what Vaclav Havel did. This is when he was still a dissident in Czechoslovakia. Uh, he he and his circle, and I, they also did it in Poland. They had, you know, they were living under oppressive communism, and they said, "Well, enough's enough. Let's live how we want to live in a parallel society to this society that." that we can't deal with anymore. So, so they started to live right. as they would live, you know, so it's almost like in a Philip K. Dick novel where you have these parallel societies that don't even, aren't even aware of each other in a way. <clears throat> and so they, they started this and I, and what, so what Guido was saying was that, you know, you don't want to reject uh, technology and which speaks to your work and the internet. But my question was, well, then how do we develop a parallel structure and as because we've seen over the last couple of years the the tendency of the big internet companies and search engines and so forth to impose limits on exactly the kind of peer-to-peer -peer, uh phenomenon Absolutely. you're talking yeah. about yeah yeah so first of all they're they're no longer peer-to-peer -peer in their essential structure right they're peer-to-peer -peer up at the front end Mm -hmm. as kind of an illusion but they control you know they have a centralized and they own your data and they you know they have algorithms and they control what you see and what you can say and you know i'm a i'm a, a 
I'm a curator. Uh, I've done that all my life, and I've, I've been doing it like 20 years on Facebook. Or maybe, maybe not 20, I don't know, you know time, when they yeah. started. 15, I forgot, probably, but yeah. but I, I've been there like a long, long time. And it's become awful. It's <clears> become awful for two reasons. One is their own censorship. And, you know, you can't say anything about COVID. You can't say anything about the Ukraine. And, mm-hmm. and you know, there's like a number of, you, know, you can't say anything about wokeism. So there's these topics where, like, you know, you... you now, you know, you can't say grooming anymore on Facebook, mm-hmm. on Twitter and on Reddit, right? The word grooming is banned. Right. And now they, uh, you know, they said, oh, biological males is, is uh, you know, is a bad concept. Yeah. Right. So, uh, and so they just, you know, it's Orwellian, right? It's, it's Orwellian. Newspeak. And it's, <laughs> and so what I appreciate on the right side of the of the political spectrum is because they were the first to be targeted. They are also the first to actually create alternative tech, because mm-hmm. you know the left is talking about it forever, uh, but there's nothing there, and there's nobody there. And then you see, you know, locals, for example, which is used by conservatives. It's very popular. It's mm-hmm. used. Um, and so I don't think that's a bad thing at all. I, you know, like uh, Ulbit from Curtis Yar- Yarvin, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. which is like a totally, totally peer-to-peer structure and it functions. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of Holochain, which is more on the progressive side, but it's still not there. Um, and then you have the thing that, you know, some successful like hidden technologies used by progressives, but then they, they become woke. And you can't, and so you have this wonderful P2P technology, but you can't say anything. Yeah. You know, so I, I think at this stage, we are at the stage where that's a good thing to build, you know, protected alternative spaces where you can at least think, because that's, that's the problem is that they are destroying our ability to think, mm-hmm. literally. I, I I totally agree, and I and this is what I was when you mentioned the early nineties. I remember, even not even maybe 12, 15 years ago, Google was was a free place, you know. And in fact, when they started to digitize these old books, remember this? They were digitizing, which you know was very useful to a scholar of the sixteenth and seventeenth century. They were digitizing books from that period and making them available for free. Which, to, for to me, that speaks to exactly your project. But then they started to tighten the purse strings on that. And, and not only that, but- Yeah, I, I don't, don't think it can be destroyed. No, fundamentally, <laughs> fundamentally, it's like print, right? So you, you, can, you can slow it down, you can, but fundamentally that level of differentiation is not gonna disappear. And I mm-hmm. think what they're doing now is like a three-step strategy. First step strategy is unify the narrative, right? So, all the mainstream media at the same time repeating the same thing. And it started actually with Occupy. I don't know if you know this, but yes, at the end of Occupy, the Ngram uh, system of Google shows that all the mass media started to use woke vocabulary massively, They're really a hockey stick. Mm-hmm. And there's a book about it called Woke Inc. where eventually mm-hmm. the capitalist is chronic that capital had because it was a one percent you know it was directed against them specifically and yeah. so when they saw the woke you know like they, there was a black group calling sanders out for being white supremacists they said aha 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 this is what we need to do this this is the people who will save us right so they started supporting um and since that moment that's what they're doing they you know they make a decision some i don't know where and how that happens but there is a consensus and they will all repeat it and they'll see the same thing. No, build uh, back better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was and a great example. So the, the second level is then use algorithms to, to make it difficult to access the alternative narrative. Right. And they do those two things together. And then I think the third step is cancel culture. Yeah. When one and two doesn't work, mobilize the mobs to destroy people. Yeah, and you and you, and you have one step one that, step right? two and three is, is very effective to a certain degree, but it actually doesn't help. They are still losing legitimacy, they're still losing trust. 
Um, and you know, in the end, the world neoliberal compact is is not realistic. It's um, you know, I there's a guy called Earl Thompson, which I recommend reading, and he talk, he talks about the role of ideological cartels. So what you have is you have the one percent, and they have the money, but they don't have the manpower to rule. Right. So they need the twenty percent, the professional and managerial classes. And within the managerial classes, there there is ideological stru uh, struggle. Mm -hmm. For example, in the seventies, you know, you have the oil crisis and the energy crisis, and the Keynesians are unable to give an answer to this. They just you know want to spend more, and then you got inflation. And they, you know, their tool book doesn't work anymore. And suddenly you have this small group among color in society. Okay, these are the people we need, right? And they started promoting them as neoliberals. Right. And then in the 80s, they, they come into power with Thatcher and Reagan. But a, an ideological cartel can actually destroy a society. And the, the example he gives is 17th century Holland, where, you know, I don't know how they were called, but some bourgeois ideologues told the government, oh, you know, abolish the guilds. They're not, they're good for nothing. And they did abolish the guilds. And then the working class refused to serve in the army because they had no reason to. As long as they had the guilds, they felt they were protecting themselves, mm -hmm. their interests. Without the guilds, they didn't want to go to war. And Holland lost his hegemony. Right? And I, I think woke, wokeism is a, is a panic reaction, uh, but it's going to lead to a wave of neo reactionary working class. Groups. And it is, you know, like it's the doing Canadian, that right now, right? Yeah. Canadian truckers, Dutch farmers, right. yellow vests. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. And what you see is that the populist right has become the working class party. You know, Which, the, the workers that vote, right? vote for them, yeah. mm -hmm. right? And, then, and now they're losing the minorities because you have, within the PMC, you have the ideological class, academia and media, and they're happy with wokeism because it's a guarantee for, you know, for career. Mm -hmm. You eliminate uh, white, the whites, the, you know, the historical elite, and you replace them and everybody can go up. So that's a good thing for them. But the business owners, right? When they hear that they, they should learn in class that working hard, being on time, studying hard, our white supremacy culture, yeah, they lose them, right? And that's why they're all moving to the right. Um, yeah. And so I, you know, I'm, I was on the left. I, I'm still on the left in terms of like ecological transformation and social justice, the real social justice, not mm -hmm. the, you know, not the ones that, that uh, woke talk about. But, you know, I, I, I'm in despair about the left because I see all my friends, everyone is, is, you know, capitulating to the woke. I see, I, so, I see it too. I mean, I'm going to, you know, have a career as an academic. <laughs> yeah. And it's, and it's, it's interesting. And you mentioned, and I'm, I, I talked about this years ago. You mentioned how uh, the, what you call the ideological cartels, right? Which is really, yeah. and, and you mentioned 17th century uh, Holland, but also 16th century England. You got to think, how did um, the British nation go from being a, a completely Catholic nation where Henry VIII was named the, the defender of the faith by the Pope. Right. And with in just a decade becomes a Protestant nation. What well, becomes that because it, it's not by appealing to the peasantry, it's by appealing to the middle managers, the lords right. and the, the, the clerics, the yeah. disgruntled clerics, which is exactly what happened uh, and has been happening in I don't know, probably Europe the same as in, in, in the United States. And yeah. are, are you the academics. In the are you academic the right? yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Go are ahead. you aware of the Spen Spenglerian ideas? So he says that so any civilization starts with what we call the pre-culture phase. That's when you know some nomadic group gets control of a territory and starts building roots. Mm -hmm. So they denomadize and but their capital is still moving around, like Charlemagne. Mm -hmm. So then as they grow, you have the consolidation of the two estates, the priesthood and the military, and the you know the, the chivalry, the knights. Right. Those are the two the two estates, right? As they grow, the cities evolve. 
And in the cities, you have the third estate. And the third estate will ally with the monarch against the estates. And that creates the nation. And the nation creates a fourth estate, which is the working class that creates democracy, mm -hmm. right? And then the democracy degenerates and creates Caesarism. So that's kind of like the, the cycle described by Spengler. Yeah, yes. And I, I see, I see a, a lot of truth to that. I, I just... Um, you know, I, I, I think it's he's got it right on that. It's, it's exactly how that happens. And so what you describe in, you know, in, uh, in England and France, and, you know, so what Spengler actually brings to the table is to show that this happened in Islam, this happened in China, this happened in Japan. And I was totally surprised by reading that. I had no mm -hmm. idea that land had been commodified in Byzantium and in Rome. You know, we think these are like eminently modern capitalist things. No, no, it happened in Rome, it happened in Byzantium, it happened in China. Mm. And so we've reached <laughs> the end of the road. We reached the end of the road of a particular civilizational model. Yeah. And, you know, then we can go towards this integration, which is, you know, the five centuries after the Roman Empire. And, and I or think we can go we can go to something higher and more complex, which we, we, we simplify by integrating the difference, right. right? Now, when I read your work, I, I see you know, like, and I, th I see a kind of resonance with mine because uh, I, I think what I, what I, what I read, the subtext in your work is that you saw this, this collapse coming <clears throat> and, you, and you were anticipating what kind of civilization we could build as this one falls apart. I mean, I saw that. It, I, I have to say, it came a little more swiftly than I thought it would, but I saw it coming. Yeah. You know, so eight, you know, 2018, I wrote, I published a book, Transfiguration, which I, I yeah, yeah. saw that. Yeah, you, and I said that- You're the, groping, you know, you're groping for this second age of revolution, right? That, yeah. That's, that's what, what you're about. And, and you know, I, I don't have the same spiritual schooling, uh, but I think, you know, I consider wokeism the end of the road for immanentism, mm -hmm. or for this kind of pseudo rationality, deficient rational mode, yeah. right? And what it tells me, because, you know, I'm not a particularly, I'm a spiritual person, I'm not a particularly religious person. So I'm a bit in the situation of Jordan Peterson. Like, I know what I don't like, but it's it's hard for me to step over to the next, right. you know, to the, the step of being like yeah. a, a person of faith. But but I am I am animated by by spiritual concerns. Yeah, you know, without any doubt, and I'm interested, and I you know I read I read uh, spiritual books and religious books, and and you know. But the thing is, yeah. So I I think the you know so I made some mistakes. One is that mm -hmm. I had become myself a pure horizontalist. You know, somebody would ask me, "What is your spirituality?" Said. Well, you know, my engagement gives me all I need. I just can't find any space or anything else on my engagement with, with fellow human beings trying to create a better world. It was enough until the moment I got canceled. And, you know, I could also see the emptiness of these horizontal linkages because the network doesn't have solidarity. That's something you learn very quickly, right? The, the, the network is people linking together by affinity. And as soon as they notice that the affinity is gone, they're also gone. So, you know, like when I was attacked in 2018, most of my progressive friends just, you know, nobody was there. Oh, yeah, nobody had your to, back. You know, and, and this was per, at the personal level, very, very hard to, to stomach because I'd given like, 15 years of my life you know and seven years working for free without income and i lost what i had and so you know that was very hard to take um and so the second thing where i think i was wrong was the, the smooth i i did hope for a smooth transition you know like going up high right and as i've been reading more about past transitions i've given that 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 hope up. I think it never happened. Even, you know, even when you say capital state nation was a higher synthesis, 
Yeah, but after three centuries of civil war. Right. And after enormous suffering for the working class and the dispossession of the farmers, right? So sure, yeah, but you know that wasn't in any way an easy and smooth operation either. Um, and the, but the third thing, whereas I think also I was wrong, was I didn't anticipate that the cultural disintegration would precede the ecological integration. Now, of course, they are linked. I don't dispute that Absolutely. they are linked. But to be honest, I. I, you know, wokeism like completely came, you know, I didn't anticipate that. I, and when I, when I discovered it, I thought this is not possible. Like this is such a low quality thinking. This is such a scape, primitive scapegoating mechanism. Mm -hmm, absolutely. It's, it, it, you know, yeah, a few, a few crazy students, but that it would take over all the institutions in less than five years. I didn't see it coming. Right. Well, I, and, <clears throat> I saw it coming, but I didn't. <clears throat> pardon me. I didn't think it would gain so much power. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and well, what I didn't see is I didn't see the. I didn't see how the corp, the corporations and government, acquiescing to it. No. And I was surprised. Yeah, That's what really and it, and it happened. So, and when you pointed to. Uh, the the protests uh, against the bankers and the one percent in it was about 2007 or 2008 right but that was part of uh, 2011 was it 2011, 2011? well well I'm, I'm thinking 2008 when uh, barack obama was erected elected right yeah it took, and, it took and it was it was very it, yeah. and it was very much in, and i and i remember telling friends back then i said he's, he's not he's not the savior <laughs> You know, it's just rhetoric. He's just another neocon. Right. Trust me, he's good. Right. And they thought, well, you're just you're a racist. You don't like you don't want to have a black. Person. No, 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 no. I've been teaching black people for 30 years. I, I have no problem with with people who are of who are black and being in power. But he's just a neocon. And yeah. what they use, and so they use, and what happened, I think, is the gov governments across the world use the language of the woke as a tool of oppression yeah it's right? it's diversifying the elite against the people but that and you know it's an attempt to diversify the elite to consolidate a group of people um and i i think they don't have the numbers they don't have the numbers to mm -hmm. carry it out I, so I, that's why i'm hopeful uh you know i i was first hopeful that was so irrational it could never happen mm -hmm. yeah and then here. it happened <laughs> uh and so now, you know, I think this this is just, you know, mathematically in terms of numbers, you, you cannot rule against the people, right? Even a despot, a tyrant, needs legitimacy, and they don't have it. No, they don't. They and don't you can see it. it, and it's interesting. I mean, you, you mentioned the Dutch farmers, and I don't know what you're hearing in Thailand, but in the United States, there is nothing in the news media about what's going on. No, you have to look Holland. for it. Yeah, you have to. You and have that's to why. In it. fact, I got on Twitter precisely because I, I felt when well, we actually when uh, the protests were happening last year, it must have been last year, and I couldn't hear anything about it. So I said, "Well, I got to find out someplace." My wife said, "Go on Twitter; it's all there," which I did. It's it, of course there's more there's censorship there, but but you can find. Yeah, some of you, these things that you are know, going if on. If you choose the right people, there's yeah, there's ways but it's a, it is stunning. In fact, I just saw. I have to mention this. Um, I just saw this story about um, some George Soros-funded think tank in Ireland, who's kind of listed has a list of broadcasters who need to be watched on Twitter and things like this. And right. I didn't. I didn't see your name, but a lot of people you probably admire are on there. <laughs> but, it's, <laughs> but it's. But th this is the kind of thing we're you know we're talking about is you can, and you can tell that they're scared. Yeah, yeah. Because they yeah. see no, no, the, it's, um... the working class united with you know. I I, I would call it a, even a spiritual class because I think what you're you know, like you're talking about. Where you where you were in the horizontal and you, you you lost the vertical dimension, I mean I think a lot of and people even uh, Reiner Fuhlmich, do you know him? No, he's a, a German American lawyer and 
He's like you. He says, I'm not really a religious person, but guess what? This is a spiritual battle. Yeah. You know, well, I, I agree with that. I, yeah. I agree with that. And um, so, so the problem I see is, so I, I think we, we ended the cycle of the French Revolution, right? 1789, left and right. Yeah. So from that, from that moment on, the religious debate is done. People no longer translate politics into religion. They go directly to politics and they fight you know, around ideologies and class interests and stuff like that. 1848, the left becomes working class because before it was a bourgeois radical, right? It's, right. it's only after 1848 that it becomes like the, the working class movement. And then 89, you know, kills off the utopia, definitely. Mm -hmm. And then the left slowly and actually quite fast becomes the party of the cognitariat of the educated people in the cities. Yeah. And they drift more and more separate from the working class until they actually theorize it. Uh, I think in the early 2000s, you have these reports coming out from think tanks saying, oh, we should become a coalition of minorities. And, you know, and the, mm -hmm. so that's when they go completely, you know, not woke fully, but the premises are there. Yeah. The, you know, that they're no longer working class parties. And so the working class gets alienated and now expresses itself in these right-wing populist movements. And so paradoxically, you know, even though I think they don't pay sufficient attention to climate change and ecological issues, and, you know, they're very often like market ideologues and stuff, I right. still think that something may happen on that side. And mm -hmm. you know that's why what I see happening in the U.S. with national conservatism, with new polity, and at least in terms of thinking, you see something happening. And then of course you have Poland and Hungary, you know, which are nationalistic, sovereignist parties, but with a strong solidaristic um, aspect, right? The, um, yeah, Hungary. Hungary spends 2% of its GDP on family support. So if you have two children, you actually get some kind of basic income from the government. Right. And you notice also with those, those countries, there is a, a genuine commitment to the family. Yeah. Which you don't see in most of the rest of the West. I mean, certainly you don't see it in no. the United States. No, no. Right. But, you know, it wasn't always that way. You know, my, my working know. class uh, labor parties that I know in my youth were pro-family. Yeah, same with mine. I was a Democrat. There was I didn't know what a Republican was <laughs> when I was right. a kid. I grew up in a working class yeah. city. No, no, we Detroit. you know actually the you know child support and you know holidays for kids and you know mm -hmm. yeah uh, that was all working class parties that did that. Not yeah. not the uh, even you know not the conservatives. They yeah well. I don't. They were I, the they were the elite back in the day, you know. Uh, I seriously don't think I met a conservative till I was in my twenties. <laughs> right. You know, because everybody around me was they were all working I, class I Democrats. I, I just started you know, <clears throat> because of the woke cancellation. I said, okay, if that is happening with the left, I I, I really need to broaden my my in, intake because this is, you know, they're no longer thinking. Yeah, like they're just not thinking. They're not reading they're you know saying things that are completely wrong about people like about jordan peterson mm -hmm. i checked eight different charges and they all turned out to be false yeah you know, because I'm, I'm a librarian I, I i'm a very good searcher i you know so i spent like two three weeks doing this yeah holy like, oh, can that be true and it, it always turned out not to be true yeah like you know no he doesn't want to force women to marry at gunpoint never said it never thought it mm -hmm. and so to see you know, my leftist friends going down that kind of route. Whereas, you know, when I was young, I, I had teachers like Ennis Mandel, uh, you know, the leader of the Fourth International was my professor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But these guys were real scholars. Like they they read and they didn't distort. You know, we might disagree or agree with what they said, but apart from agreeing or disagreeing, what they said was documented. Well, well, and there was, there was substance to it. And I think we, we, yeah. we've seen in the last, certainly 15 years, maybe more, uh, on, on the left is not a commitment to ideas. I mean, if you look back in the United States, for instance, to, in the 60s, 
to people like John F. Kennedy or Martin Luther King or Robert Kennedy, who are not only were they dedicated to social justice, but they were extraordinarily articulate men with, you know, really yeah. there was a philosophical underpinning of what they were saying and they had yeah. the gravitas to say it. But it seems like in the last 15 years or so, the left, uh, at least in this country, and I think in Europe, is more committed yeah. to a kind of Moralistic. rhetoric. It's, it's a, rhetoric. Well, it's, it's rhetoric. It's just language. And it's, it's really it's, language. It's moralism. It's moralism. It's, and, it, it's, it's, and its aim is power. And its aim is power, is, is amassing power yeah. for themselves. So there is, not, in, there is a, not in spreading there is truth. There's a Swedish Marxist, uh, as there is a Swedish Marxist, uh, Malcolm Kieneke, I'm not sure about his last name, but he he says, you know, what is happening now is a, is a consuming fear of proletarization, mm -hmm. right? So the, the cognitive class is itself very precarious. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I know because I am one. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're, you're living project by project. You don't have a fixed wage. It's, right. You know, and... It's the, the enduring fear is I studied, I don't want to work in McDonald's. I don't want to work in Starbucks, which a lot of them do. Right. Right. And so, and has created like a fear. And I think 2008 is a switch from an abundance thinking to a scarcity thing. Right. Yeah. So I, I was on board with inclusion and diversity till then. Why? Because fish, yeah, sure. I want you know, any institution to reflect the richness of the people who live in the country. Yeah. And why Why are 80% whites and actually, you know, I, I, I was on board with that when it meant, you know, taking people in, right? Yeah. So the idea was this place for everyone. Yeah. Uh, with woke, it changed. It's like, I can only advance if you go down, mm -hmm. right? So it's a win-lose scarcity-based paradigm. And it's the funny thing is it's mostly white people making those rules. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know, but it's it's akin to fascism uh -huh. because it's 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 a group going down. So traditionally, progressivism is groups that have a hope to get better. Yeah, and fascism are groups that have no hope to get better and want to keep what they have, or are angry because they lost it. Right, and Rene Girardi makes an interesting distinction. So he says. The extreme right is Satanists, and the extreme left is the Antichrist. And what he means is the following. Mm -hmm. The kind of fascist-like radical right identifies with um, the victimizer, right? They, they right. will talk about certain people, and we'll call them vermin, and mm -hmm. they want to smash them and make them suffer, right? Right. The, the radical left is extreme identification with victimization, right? And so what intersectionality has done, it has unified all forms of victimization, provided at the top there's the, you know, cis, white, male, right? And that justifies everybody down, down, you know, Mm -hmm. can exist as a victim because there's this one thing holding it all together yeah it happens to be us <laughs> yeah uh, and so they they displace the class issue to the race issue and the gender issue right they they, they mention class but it's only rhetoric they, they don't mean it they never ask no. somebody like about their financial privilege it doesn't exist it never no. happens mm -hmm. you know it's always about gender and race um, which yeah. happens to be very serviceable to the elite, you know, so they're now no longer being criticized. They're no longer 1%. Yep. It's perfect. And to flex the attention from them, yeah. give you something else to fight about. Well, we're probably getting toward the end here. I know it's getting late in Thailand. Um, so um, I want to thank you so much for, for doing this, Michelle. And I wonder if there's anything you could uh, leave our listeners with, you know, to th to think about what to to work toward as a people, as, as a commons. Right. Well, in, in one way, I'm extremely pragmatic. I think what is important now is to ensure, as an individual, like where is your solidarity coming from, like 
Will you have access to food, to energy, to transport, to housing? And if not, where can you get it? And in that sense, mutualizing is really a very good option, right? So there's things that you can't afford on your own that you can't afford if you, if you get together as a group. Yeah. So very, and this is what urban commoning is about or even rural commoning is about. It's about, you know, going back to the essentials because the market is not going to provide them. And, and even the state, it's, you know, it's, it's doubtful whether it's going to succeed in uh, even with rationing. And, you know, so I think, you know, going back to co-ops and, and local, you know, that's all very important. And at the same time, I think, don't stay at the local in terms of thinking, you know, ally yourself. And then I think, you know, maybe because I'm an intellectual, but I think, to preserve quality thinking, to preserve personal integrity, to create spaces where you can have dialogues with people who are different. You know, I, I know it's not very exciting, but- uh, No, it is, no, it I'm, is, that's, it's important. I mean, yeah. it, it, in a way, it's, it's what we used to take for granted as kids, right? Yeah, you know, we have to strengthen the seeds, right? We, we can't win right now, mm -hmm. we, we can't, but the system is disintegrating. Right, so you have one water level is going down, another water level is going up slowly. Yeah. Right, and so at some point it switches. I can't say when, I can't say how, but it's the things we're doing now to organize, you know, em empirically working alternatives yeah. that are going to make the difference in the next 10 to 15, 20 years. Yeah, that's good. Well, yeah, I mean, we, we you, you know, plant an apple tree, you don't know if you're going to be there to get the fruit. Right. It's the, it's the deed. All right. Well, so, <laughs> thank you so much, Michelle. This has been such a pleasure. A I, pleasure can, I can keep and going. I, yeah, I, I hope we stay in touch. And I Please hope, do. you know, I'm, I'm open to any collective intellectual projects. And, and yeah, me uh, too. you know, I love your work. I've read your book. I watched your uh, eight uh, episodes. Okay. I found it uh, extremely, extremely interesting and inspiring. Thanks a lot. And your uh, work really so, inspires yeah. me. And we got to get you on here with Guido. That would be a wonderful conversation. Yeah, oh, that would be okay. wonderful. Yeah, I look well, forward to that. I, I think, you know, there's nothing more important than connecting people like us now. Yeah, well, so we'll you do. Know. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. That was really a pleasure. And we'll, we'll see you next time. And everybody, yeah. we'll see you next week on, on the Regeneration po Podcast. Thank you, Michael. Thank you.